Right. Start in First John chapter three. Great passage in the Bible. I've covered this passage before, but we started here. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time in here, but uh, what I want to preach on tonight. Pretty, pretty simple, pretty basic sermon, just going over our sin nature. The fact that, you know, once you are born again, we still are left with this flesh. We still are left with this body that is going to drive us to sin. But the good thing is, is that once you're born again, you have the spirit that's going to compel you or drive you to do what's right. The problem is that we have a daily battle, it's a struggle until the day that we die or until our flesh is changed, we're going to have this struggle. And I kind of want to just go over that and expound upon that a little bit and maybe help you out uh, because in your walk with God, in your spiritual life, you're going to have ups and downs. There's going to be just, I mean, that's just the way it is. Obviously, we want to strive to be at the peak of our spirituality all the time. I mean, we want to be, the goal is just to be walking in the Spirit. I mean, from the time you wake up in the morning to the time you go to bed, you're just Spirit-filled. You're doing the things that God would have you to do. That's the goal. And we don't want to lose sight of that goal. But reality is that we do still have this flesh, and nobody's perfect, right? Nobody is always in the Spirit. But we have to be able to deal with that, right? Um, I was just speaking to someone this afternoon, and this is one of the reasons why I preach a sermon like this, is because all too often, people will, will get weak in their flesh and allow themselves to succumb to some temptation or lust of the flesh that's going to get them involved in sin. And then because you have the Spirit, because you're a child of God, you're going to feel ashamed. And that's good. You ought to feel ashamed when you sin. But the problem that people have is they allow that shame and that guilt to defeat them. And will end up oftentimes getting them out of church because, man, I feel really guilty. I don't feel like I should be here. I don't feel, I've done this sin. I've done this wrong. I don't think I, I, I should even be here. I don't know how I can show my face. I've, you know, I've done this thing. And, and they just, they get out of church. And instead of getting rid of what, what's causing that guilt to begin with, right? Getting right with God and then continuing to go to church and continuing to try to serve God because that's the right thing to do. Unfortunately, they, they add kind of sin upon sin. Yeah. So what you don't want to do is forsake the assembling of ourselves together because that in itself is a sin. Yeah. So when you, when you feel guilty about doing something wrong, the answer is not, well, I'm just going to get out of church for a while. Right. Well, now you, the good way to go, you just added more sin unto your own sin. You need to be able to plow through that and have her answer and say, you know what? I'm going to confess and forsake because what I did was wrong. And yeah, be guilty. Be, be you know, ashamed. That's a good thing, though. The Bible says that godly sorrow worketh repentance. It's a good thing that you feel bad about sinning. Because that's that's a one mechanism to help you not want to do that again. I don't want to feel this way again. I don't want to go through the guilt and, and everything else that goes along with my sin, I want to do what's right. I want to be able to lay my head down on the pillow and, and have comfort and peace, which comes with walking in the Spirit, because you're not just fulfilling the lusts of your flesh. So, there's a lot of things that people, especially as you grow, the reason why we started First 1 John chapter 3, I want to explain, first of all, just the fact that we have the Spirit and as many of you probably have heard, as I like going to the illustration in uh, soul winning, you know, when you put your trust in Jesus Christ, you're born again. And the Bible relates people that are born again as being newborn babes in Christ. And that just as much as when you're physically born, you need to grow, right? As a baby, babies aren't fed steak meals, excuse me, right? As soon as, as, soon as they come out of the womb. They get mama's milk. They get the, the sustenance that they need 
and, and it's very simple. It's very little what they what they receive to grow thereby. They need it more frequently. They eat more frequently. They're, they're, they're getting this food. They're getting the sustenance. But it's not these huge meals. They're getting a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit there. And then they're growing bigger. And then their meals become a little bit, you know, further apart, but more substantive. Right? As you grow, as you get older, and you continue to grow. Well, spiritually, it's very similar. As a newborn babe, you need to get a lot of basic fundamentals, just, just core doctrine, read through the Bible, start seeing all these things that are written in the Bible, and you need to grow thereby. But because you still reside with this flesh, there's always going to be a battle from that day forward. And unfortunately, when you first get saved, you know, it's a brand new spirit, but you need to cultivate and help your spirit to grow by choosing to do the things that your flesh doesn't want to do. So, especially early on, and this is why you can see larger numbers of people receiving Christ and getting saved. And if you look, you know, we're going over numbers regularly. Hey, how many people led someone to Christ? Well, you know, how many people got saved? The difference between the amount of people who freely receive a gift, because that's all salvation is, versus the number of people who then take that and decide to get up early, go to church, you know, do something that maybe they've never done before, they're not used to doing, and going out and changing their pattern, their behavior, because they've received that gift, there's a lot, there's a lot less people that will choose to do that. Now it's not zero, we still see, we had someone this morning that got saved out soul morning and came to church. And amen, praise God for that. But a lot of people don't. Why? You say, well then they just didn't really get saved, did they? No. It just means that they're not cultivating their spirit at all. It doesn't mean the spirit's not there. It just means that their flesh is strong. It just means that their flesh that has been, you know, operating a certain way for a long period of time of maybe sleeping in on Sundays, right? Having this free day before I've got work tomorrow to, to hang out or to do this or to do that or watch football, whatever it is has already been established. You've already got this mold. You've already got this pattern. It's really easy to continue on that same path and not do the things that are spiritual, not do the things that God would have you to do, which is why, one of the reasons why church is so important. You can, you can go around other believers and get some encouragement and promote one another into love and the good works and, uh, and, you know, and do that. But that also just helps to cultivate your, the strength of your spirit. Right? We want our spirit to be really strong, to be this you know, powerhouse, right? Think about just working out. Physically working out, you need to keep at it. And if you don't, you're going to deteriorate, right? If you're not working out on a regular schedule, and not only just working out, but then like adding and continually trying to get to get stronger and stronger and stronger, you'll end up you know, either just kind of hitting your peak or even going backwards when you don't maintain it. It's Spiritually, it's the same thing. We need to be focused on moving forward all the time because we have a battle. Because it's not just spirit. Because you've got flesh that's always going to be warring to gain the upper hand. To say, no, no, no. Don't go to church. No, no. Don't go soul winning. No, don't read your Bible. No, don't pray. Don't, don't do those things. I want to just feel good and lounge around. I want to watch TV. I want to just do whatever and waste my time and waste your life because it's really comfortable. Because all those things are just really comfortable. It's comfortable just to lay on the couch. I'm just going to do nothing today and, and relax. Now I see some laughter, and, and it is kind of funny once you get involved in living a spiritual life. But I'll tell you what, when, when I first started going to church, even at Faithful Word, the first Sunday I visited, man, I loved it. I wanted to go back. But it wasn't set as the priority in my life. It was important. I was saved. I wanted to go to church there. I was really happy that I found the church. But I didn't go back the, the very next week. And in fact, when Pastor Anderson had actually stopped by and visited me uh, on a Saturday, just to follow up and see, you know, to, to see if I was still interested in coming back to church or whatever. Just kind of follow up and whatever. 
I was already planning on coming back, but when he showed up, I was lounging at the pool. I was renting a room from one of my friends, living at his house. Pool in the backyard, Saturday, just hanging out, floating around, <laughs> listening to music, because why not? Because that's where my mind was. Because I was living in the... Now, was I saved? Yes. But was I living in the flesh? Yes. Yeah, now, I'm not saying you can't go swimming. Right? I'm not saying, like, oh, if you do that, you're just not right with God. <laughs> this was my pattern, though. That's just what I did regularly. Just wasting my time. Was I reading my Bible? No. Was I praying? No. Was I soul winning? Absolutely not. I've never even gone soul winning before. No. I wouldn't do it any of those things. Did God want me doing those things? Yes. <laughs> those are all things I should have been doing? Absolutely. But I wasn't doing those things. Why? Because I was allowing myself to live in the flesh. I'd already given up trying to find a good church, you know, for, for years and years, and just out wasting my time and wasting my life. And you know what? It was pretty comfortable overall. Yeah, there were times where I felt convicted just because I still had the spirit. And I knew, you know what, when I look back and reflect, you know, I, I really ought to get in church. I really ought to start doing. But it's not like it was there all the time. Because I allowed my flesh to strengthen and just get stronger. We have this battle regularly. Let's, let's dig into the chat. I'm, 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 I don't want to just keep going on and on with my personal stories. But uh, this, I, just, I said all of that. Just to help illustrate why this is important, why we need to, to look at the scripture and look at ourselves and, and make sure that we can stick with it even when we have these problems. And, you know, I, I hear questions from people and say, oh, well, you know, people doubt themselves. Well, I don't really feel like going to church. Is that, I, I don't feel like reading my Bible. You know, how do you answer that? Well, I answer that with you have the flesh. That's why. You have this flesh. But you need to be able to work at overcoming it. It's good to recognize and be able to step back and say, you know, I really don't feel like doing this. But the, but the point is, what are you going to do about it? What action are you going to take when you feel that way? Are you going to give in to your desire, to your flesh and desire to just take rest, a little, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, like the book of Proverbs says, you know, and then your destruction is going to come because... You know, ultimately end up being lazy. But um, First John chapter three. Let's start from the beginning of just showing, and demonstrating that we have this spirit. And like I said, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time here, but this is a great chapter explaining the difference between the new man and the old. The difference between the spirit and the flesh. That once you are saved, you become a son of God. The Bible says in, in John chapter one. Verse 12, as many as received him, but then gave you power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on his name. So when you believe on the name of Jesus Christ, you become a son of God. You are born again. John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. So referring to that same birth, being born again. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. This is referring to when we get a new glorified body. Because, hey, we're the sons of God because we're born again. Spiritually, that spirit's there. But physically, we still don't have that full conversion of being a child of God, of being a son of God. When we get our new body, our body's transformed into uh, his life. Verse 3, it says, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. So now it's starting to show the difference between you know, sinning and not sinning. And, and a lot of people, I can understand why you might get confused about this. But as we go through, there's a few more verses, it, it becomes very clear what this is trying to explain and what this is talking about. We have, you know, even starting at the first chapter of 1 John, 1 John chapter 1, it explains, look, if anyone says that they have no sin, you know, the truth is not in them, and, and they're making God a lie. So, like, it's obvious, it's clear that we have sin. 
So this is going further and a little bit deeper to explain a concept that isn't just on the surface saying, well, you're just not a sinner. And, and there's a lot of Pentecostals, there's not a lot, maybe there's some out there that will teach the sinless perfection, that you can be perfect, you can be without sin. And this would be one of the reasons why they're confused. Well, the biggest reason why they're confused is because they're not saved, but right. um, because they can't understand spiritual things. That's the real reason. But then they turn, because they're blind, they look at verses like this, and they'll say, oh, well, the Bible says that, uh, you know, whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Well, I see him and know him, so I must, you know, I must not sin, or whatever. It's not what this is talking about. Look at verse number seven. The Bible says, little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Verse number nine, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. So you're born again, you're born of God, you don't commit sin. But then it explains why. Why don't you commit sin? And, and who is this whosoever is born of God? Well, whosoever is born, it's the, it's the, the spirit that's born again. The person right. that, is, that is, becomes the Son of God within you, that new man does not commit sin. It says, for his seed remaineth, remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. And that new spirit that's born inside of you is born of the word of God, of the precious seed. That's what brings forth that life. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That word of God is planted in your heart and produces life when you put your trust in Christ. That's the seed that brings forth that life. And once that new spirit is inside of you, that new spirit never sins. That is the new man. You read through the Bible, new man versus old man, that's the new man. That's the new spirit. That spirit never sins. Never. Amen. That's why when we shed this flesh, if I were to die today, my flesh is going to remain right here. This is what's causing me to sin. But my spirit, my spirit is sinless. And that's going to continue on and, and separate from the sinful flesh and continue on with Jesus Christ. So when you want to do good, and this is explained better in Romans. So turn if you go to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter number 7. Must be the yardman outside of it. Scared them all in. That's not the good place for that one. <laughs> Romans chapter 7. We're going to start reading in verse number 7. It's explaining what the, what the law is to us and how that basically the law... Uh, ultimately ends up condemning us because we've broken the law. But it's not because the law in itself is bad. Right? It's not the law's fault that we've broken the law. Right. Verse number 7, the Bible says, What shall we say that is the law sin? God forbid. The, the law isn't bad. The law isn't sinful. There's nothing bad about the law. The law is the law. The law is good. The law is right. The law is actually really good. It shows us the right way. It says, Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Well, thou shalt not covet. That's a really good thing for us to, to follow and adhere to. That's good for us. The law is good. The problem is that we fail. Yeah. Verse 8, But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive once without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And this is actually a verse I like to turn to to show people why I believe that, you know, children up to a certain age, or excuse me, maybe more appropriately, up to a certain understanding, not just necessarily an age, I don't think we're in this particular age, up to a certain understanding, they're alive. Just as the Apostle Paul's writing, I was alive once without the law once. Now the law existed, but... When you don't, you can't comprehend the law, like a little an infant, a little child, they don't know the difference between right and wrong. They have no idea. Well, how can they transgress the law? They have no concept of even good and bad, right and wrong. No idea. Well, they're still alive. Their spirit hasn't died because of sin, because they can't sin. It's, it's not, 
And in this, uh, you know, I need to make note of that too because I'm talking about our sin nature. While I do believe that God created us with the capability of becoming sinful, I do not believe and I reject the, the original sin as taught by like either the Catholic Church or Reformed doctrine that will say, well, because Adam sinned, we are all um, basically guilty of his sin that passes on to us. We have the sinful nature, the ability to sin, the, you know, the, the, the drive to sin, but that we're still all responsible for our own sins. So we are not judged as deserving of hell because of what Adam did. We are judged of hell because of what we own you, we, we, what we do. Their view puts babies in danger of hellfire because of Adam. That's why they baptize babies. Because they think that that will wash away their sins until they get to the point to where they can do something else and do some other works. Because of works-based salvation. That's why we don't baptize babies. Because we believe the Bible. And especially where the Bible says, hey, I was alive once without the law once. Just as little children are up until they get to the understanding. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. That's when your spirit dies when you sin. Just like with Adam. Adam was alive until spiritually, you know, the Bible says that the day that thou eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. And he didn't die physically that day. Which means that he had to have died spiritually because we know that when God says something, it's going to come to pass. And it's true. And it absolutely was true in the day that Adam ate of the fruit thereof. That day he died, even though he didn't die physically because his spirit died. He was alive until sin entered in. Same exact concept. This is for without the law, sin was dead. Verse number 9. For I was alive without the law, or we just read that. Verse number 10. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Saying that, well, the law is great. It's holy. It's good. It's just. The law is right. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. The law isn't made death. It says that the law is all good. It says, but sin, the difference between law and sin, sin is the breaking, the transgressing of the law. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. The law is spiritual. So for us to be walking in the spirit, we should be obeying the law, obeying God's commandment. And that'll help you to walk in the spirit. But I am carnal, sold under sin. This is the apostle Paul still saying he's carnal. You know, yeah. People say, oh, there's no such thing as a carnal Christian. Okay. The apostle Paul wasn't a Christian. Right. Or he wasn't carnal when under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, he says, I am carnal. <laughs> Take your pick. Right? Either way, you're, you're contradicting what the scripture says. No, he's saying that he is carnal. He sold him. He said, for that which I do, I allow not. He's saying that he himself, he's doing things sometimes that he doesn't really want to do. He doesn't allow it for himself, but because he lives in a sinful flesh, it still happens. For what I would, so what I would, when you see like would, that's what he wants to do. What I want, that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. Inwardly, in our spirit, we want to serve God perfectly. All the time. We want to do what's right. But sometimes doing those things just doesn't happen. It just, it doesn't. And, he, and he's kind of lamenting here. He's like, well, what I want to do, I'm not doing it. And, and what I don't want to do, I, you know, what I hate, I end up doing those things. Why does this happen? He says, if then I do that, which I would not, I consent unto the law, that is good. Hey, if I do the things I'm not supposed to, the law is still good. That doesn't change the law one bit. Just because I've done things I shouldn't. Verse 17, now then it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. He's not saying this to absolve all responsibility for his actions. He's explaining that... The reason why you can even still do these things, even though you're born again, even though you've got the Spirit of God, even though the Spirit you know, doesn't commit sin, it's because sin dwells within us, in our flesh. We have this flesh that's going to drive us to sin. 
So he's saying it's not me in the sense that the new man. It's no more I. It's not the new man that wants to only do good, that can't sin. It's the sin that dwells in me. My flesh is constantly working against me. Verse 18, and that's why I said this, For I know that in, in me, that is in my flesh, being real specific here, dwelleth no good thing. There is nothing good that comes from your flesh. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Very interesting passage. Again, a great passage, I think, that just destroys Calvinism. He's literally saying to will is present. I have a will. It's present with me. I get to decide. I have a will. But how to perform that which is good, I find out to do that. Amount. But I'm having a hard time actually following through and doing it. I want to do it, but something's preventing me from doing it. And that something is his flesh. That's, that's just working against him from doing everything that he wants to do. We all have this influence to one degree or another. But to will is still present with you. The will is there. Jesus Christ, when he was on this earth, yes, he was God in the flesh. Obviously, he's a, he's a very special person. But he felt the temptations of our bodies that would drive us to do things that are wrong. And he never gave in or succumbed to the weariness of the flesh, that you know, anything that would go along that would that we can use to say, oh yeah, I'm not gonna do what's what's right, what God would have me to do because of some physical gratification. He was able to, to manage to do everything without that. So he's an example. Obviously we're not perfect, he was perfect, yet he still went through everything that we would experience and feel and still able to do it. He said, he continues on verse 19, For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that, I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So it kind of reiterates that point. It's, it's not me. What I really want to do and what I'm actually doing is the sin that, that, that's in my flesh that's causing this problem. Verse 21, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. And there's a reference to the inward man. The inward man loves God's law. The inward man rejoices in God's law and wants, he wants to follow all of God's law. He says, but I see another law in my members. Members just meaning like body parts, like in his flesh. I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. So in your mind, that new man, a new spirit, you want to do what's right all the time, but your flesh is going, no, 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 don't do that. Serve me, because in your flesh dwells nothing good. Right. Even just understanding this concept will hopefully help you to be able to identify, whoa, wait a second, my flesh really doesn't want me to do this. But what's right? And, and think about it in your mind instead of just reacting to an impulse of your flesh. I mean, this is what you need to do on a regular basis anyways. To overcome sin in your life is first just recognize, I need to stop doing this. And people have addictions. I mean, you may have a hard time with it, but you need to be able to recognize, first of all, this is, you know, my flesh really wants to do this, but this is not what God would have me to do. And make the choice. You still have the will. Don't ever get the feeling like, well, I just can't do it. Yes, you can. All right. You can. There have been plenty of people that have proven and have overcome whatever obstacles in their life. It really is a matter of will. And you don't get asking God for the strength that you need to help overcome that. But it can all be overcome. It can all be overcome. You have to decide what's important. What is your priority? Where is that? Where is that going to rest? Uh, let's keep reading here to finish up chapter 7 verse 24 says oh wretched man that I am who shall deliver me from the body of this death I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God with the flesh the law of sin this is why believers even though you know you truly believe you're saved you still sin yeah. you yeah. still have these problems it doesn't make you unsaved it doesn't make you you know some horrible person it just means that you're a sinner 
And as far as good and bad goes, the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. None of us are good people anyways. Doesn't, I'm not trying to make light of sinning. I'm just saying that we have, we have a sinful nature that's part of us. We need to overcome that. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, well, you know what, I don't know if I want to... Yeah, let's, I'm going to skip over this. Let's go to Matthew 26. I think I've, I've well, Romans 7 and Romans 8 go hand in hand. Read that later. I encourage you to just, just go through Romans 8. It continues on talking about the, the walking not after the flesh, but after the spirit and, and things like that. A lot, a lot of great passages there. Um, but I, I, I kind of want to fast forward to what we can do to overcome the sin. We want this understanding. We've got this, this dichotomy. We've got this battle going on internally. But we really need to figure out how to overcome that. Uh, the Bible, Jesus Christ even told the, the disciples, you know, that your spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he took, you know, some of his top disciples with him. We have Peter, and it says the two sons of Zebedee, James and John. He brings them with him in, in his darkest hour where he's just about to be crucified. It says he began to be sorrowful and very heavy, so he needs people there to rely on, to help strengthen him, to help comfort him. It says, then say at the end of them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. So he brings back, can you, you know, my soul is sad. I'm, I need your help. Please stay with me. Watch with me. It says he went a little bit further, fell on his face and prayed, saying, oh, my father, may be possible, possible. Let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What? Could ye not watch with me one hour? Say, Peter, I just, I, you know, I need you here. I brought you here to be with me, and you're, you're falling asleep. Can't you just be with me for an hour? He says, Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The Spirit indeed is willing. He says, I know you want to. I know you want to be here with me, but the flesh is weak. And the disciples, the ones that were closest to Jesus, still succumbed to their flesh. It happened. But we don't want to let that define us and get us out and get us further away from Christ. Because maybe we have a moment of weakness or, or failure where we're falling asleep on Jesus. We just need to wake up and say, no, 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 okay, let's... let's Get back in the spirit as you get out of this flesh again. It's this constant struggle. You're not always going to be in the flesh. But how do we overcome the flesh? Well, and again, this is turn to Galatians chapter 5. It's another one of those very simple concepts. But putting into practice is always a lot harder than, than, it, than it is just understanding what's, what's right or wrong. Right? So it's usually pretty easy to, to get these basic truths down. But then actually doing it is where we, we run into the problem. Just as the Apostle Paul was explaining in Romans 7. I know what to do. I want to do what's right. But actually finding out how to do it, I'm, I'm really struggling with that. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The good thing about having this, this dual nature, having a sin nature and a spirit, is that you can only be walking in one or the other. So if you're walking in the spirit, you're not going to be fulfilling the lust of the flesh. The reason why I say it's a good thing is because, well, if you want to overcome sin in your life and try to overcome your flesh, choose to focus on spending your time doing things that God wants you to do that will put you in the spirit. There's a lot of things throughout your entire day that you can do to help put you in the spirit, which will then overcome the lust of your flesh. It will make you be walking the spirit. So, for example, singing spiritual songs, singing hymns, is something that will get you in the spirit and put you on the right path. Amen. Praying unto God. Praying in the spirit. I'm not talking about jibber jabber and speaking with unknown tongue. I'm talking about just praying and communicating with God and asking God for things and, and, and be thinking about Him and, and keeping you in that mindset. Reading scripture, meditating on scripture, 
memorizing scripture just throughout the day, inserting that into your routine from when you wake up in the morning. How about adding even just a chapter or some part of Bible reading, Bible memory, starting off the day? How about praying to God, God help me through, you know, and then throughout the day, inserting these things willfully, doing it, making it a priority to do it, and then keeping that regular dose of spirit to help strengthen you and to ward off the flesh. Because the longer you go in between time, like the people who only come to church once a, once a week and then never really do anything else throughout the week, your spirit is not being built up very much at all because the rest of the week you're basically spending in the flesh. If you're not praying, if you're not reading your Bible, if you're not doing anything else and you only show up to church, you're going to be very, very spiritually immature and weak. And your flesh is just going to grow that much more. We need to have a lot more in our life spiritually to help strengthen and make it easier to do these things. Because it's harder to do these things at first. It's harder to even go to church more than once a week at first. Because your flesh has been so strong. It's built up. I know for me it was the same exact thing. Now, I wanted to do what's right and, and it didn't take a whole lot of time before I started just going to three services every week because I loved it. I was excited, a lot of zeal, you know, wanted to do those things. But, you know, it, it can take some time when, when you have different habits just built up and, you, and your strength is kind of, your, your flesh has been strengthened. Galatians 5 16, as I, we just read, walk in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts is against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one to the other so that you cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. All of these things are what you do, or any of these things would be what you do walking in the flesh. Because and such like, it's not just like these are the only things Everything, basically, that would be contrary to God's law is a work of the flesh. To so, which I tell you before, and I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So we have this dichotomy, dichotomy walking in the flesh versus walking in the Spirit. You walk in the flesh... This is, that's what you have to look forward to. Verses 19, 20, 21. Even without the judgment of God, that doesn't sound like a very fulfilling life. To be walking in witchcraft, hatred, strife, wrath, care, you know, it's just, it's just, it just doesn't sound like a very, I kind of like the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness. That sounds more like the way that I want to live anyways. It sounds like a much more fulfilling life. Just looking at it from that perspective. So yeah, let's strive to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Because if you walk in the flesh, it's only going to bring problems to your life. The Bible says, if we live in the spirit, verse 25, let's also walk in the spirit. We live in the spirit because we've got the, because we've got the new man. So we live, we abide in the spirit, we have that with us all the time. Let's also walk in the Spirit. There's a difference. You can, you can choose not to walk in the Spirit and walk in your flesh and still abide and still have the Spirit living within you. But let's also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of being glory, provoking one another, envying one another. The Bible says in... Uh, let's turn if you would to Galatians 6. Last place I'll be turned. We're almost done. Overcoming the flesh. We've seen a lot of scripture, but let's just get a little bit more practical in uh, applying how do we do this, right? Because we, you know what's right. Most people know what's right. I know I should be doing this. I know I want to do more for God, but I really want to do more, and I want to try to get more control over my flesh. Life is literally a series of choices. You are always making choices. You have a choice to be in here right now. You have a choice... To, to wake up and go to work tomorrow. Do whatever you do with your time tomorrow. You have a choice. Everybody does. 
Husbands, fathers have choices on how they're going to run things at home. Women have choices on how they're going to raise their children or how they're going to obey their husband or how they're going to do whatever in, in regards to what the script says. You have a choice to make all the time. Always choices. Always. We are in time and you are just making choices every little thing that you do. In order to make good choices that would put you in the spirit and out of the flesh, you need to establish priorities. Values. What is important? What is it that you are going to hold to the highest level and say, this is what I want to attain? Everything else, well, how am I going to get to that? Once you have your priority established, it's going to help you make good choices. So if you're making choices based on, well, let me rethink. What are my priorities again? It's going to help you to make the right choices. Obviously, some choices are more important than others. But the bigger the decision you have to make, the more you really ought to be thinking about, what are my priorities? If I have a top priority of being right with God and serving God, the choices that you make should lead you in the spirit and not in the flesh. Which is, you know, um, I'll give you an example of a big choice in my life. And I, you know, I hate, I don't really like bringing up myself very much because I don't want to sound like I'm lifting up myself or anything like that. But when it comes to, you know, my choice of serving God, I could, I could have done anything. You can do anything. You can choose to, to be a good church member. You can choose not to be. You can choose to just come and go whatever you want and just kind of do a church thing whenever you feel like it. You can choose to, uh, you know, if you need to move or whatever, well, I'm just going to go wherever the best money is. I'm going to go wherever the best job is. And that can be, if that's your priority list, well, I want to be comfortable. I want to just have as much money as I can have then it would make sense to make decisions based on that. Well, I'm going to move my family over here because that's where I can make the most money. Because that's going to be the best job opportunities. Because that's going to be where I enjoy the weather the most. Whatever your priorities are. But if you have a priority of serving God, you're going to say, well, I want to be in the place that's going to be the best and help me to be able to achieve the most for the Lord. Where I could be around the people who love God the most. Where I could be in an area where, where I can serve God, where I could be used of God, and, and you know, those things. It comes based on priorities. You, you design the basic priorities. For me, my basic, my top priorities is God is number one in my life. Number two is my wife. So when I, when I establish importance of things, I have God, my wife, my children, and the church. That's my priority list. So when I go and make decisions on what I do with my life, and then after that is my job and everything else that, that will fall below that. Number one is God. And I think it ought to be number one in everyone's life. So we're going to make a decision. Is this right by God? That should be number one question. Either is or it isn't. If it's okay or it's not okay. If it doesn't forbid something, generally speaking, it's probably okay. But then my wife, my wife's number two. She's a, you know, uh, other than God, of course, she's going to be a priority for me, my kids and, you know, and going on down the list. That's how I use, my, I have my structure set up to help me to make good choices. Once you have your basic priorities, then you need to expand on those as you gain more wisdom and understanding. Right? Not everyone starts off with just all this knowledge that's in the scripture. You start off saying, well, if I'm going to put God first, you might not know a lot of the laws. You might not know a lot of what the Bible says, but a real simple way of putting God first is saying, well, I'm going to make it a priority to make sure I'm in church because I want to learn more. So I'm going to, I'm going to make the priority on, hey, if God is really that important, I'm going to try to be in church as much as I can. Because then I can learn more. Then I can grow more. I can understand more. I'm going to make it a priority to read my Bible every day. These are things that you can, you can do to, to formulate. And I know I'm repeating myself from what I was saying earlier. It's not a complicated formula. It's not a complicated system. 
But when you have the right part, and, and it's important to be thinking about your priorities. What is it that really matters to you? When people are, are choosing, well, I think we're going to move. Where are you going to move to and why? Make it, making a decision to move is a big decision to make. Where, where's my whole family going to live? Well, we made a decision recently to move out to Georgia. But you know what my decision was based off of? My decision was based off of, one, I want to be used by God the most. Where can I do that? So my criteria for finding a place for me to live had to do with finding, well, where is a place that's going to be receptive to the gospel? Where is a place where people are going to want to be in a church of this type and want to serve God and want to do these things? And, you know, those are all things that came into play. Further down the list, there were some other factors that I considered. One, because my wife is important, she has a lot of problem with, with cold weather, with the bones and injuries that she's had, so I wanted somewhere warm. But at the top was, well, where can I be most used by God? Where do I think that this is going to be the best place? And then further on down the list, we, we narrowed it down. I was able to hone in on certain areas and places that would work. Um, obviously, that's a big decision to make, but even just on a regular basis, uh, you need to be... You, you can also look back at what you've already done and how your week went and then compare that to your priorities. How does, how does my life fit into what I believe my priorities to be? Because you may not always be thinking about that as you go through your week because you get into routines. Think back about last week. How did last week go? What did I do? What did I do with my time? You know, how, how much time do I spend doing this, 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 this? How does that match up with where my values are, with where my priorities are? Do my actions reflect what in my mind I want to put at the top? If I spend three hours a day in front of the TV just getting entertainment, even if it's nothing simple, just say like, Documentary, YouTube, whatever, right? Just, just, I'm spending this much time just being entertained. And I'm spending 15 minutes in my Bible and five minutes in prayer. Does that reflect with my values? Is my time allotment appropriate with, with what I think is the most important thing? And then the second most important thing, because obviously you have other things you have to do. You have to work, you have to, you know, clothe yourself, you know, all these different things. So go back and analyze that and see if it's matching up. The Bible says in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 34, the Bible says, Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God, I speak this your shame. We ought to awake to righteousness. Let's, let's start the day off in righteousness. Start the day off with that Bible reading. Start the day off with that prayer. Start the day off right and sin not. It's that simple. Just don't sin. Right. Finally, you're in Galatians chapter 6. My final uh, little bit of information, if this is if I can help at all, is to not get tired of doing what's right. And just stick it out. Again, will you have the you have the will to keep pushing forward. Unfortunately, a lot of people can get very zealous and very excited and, and start doing a lot at first and, and maybe hit a point where you're just like, oh man, this is great, and then they fizzle out. Sometimes you never see those people again, like serving God, spiritually speaking, right? You just, they, where did they go? What happened? And it will happen throughout this church. You'll see people, if you, if you stick around, you'll see people come, you'll see people get on fire, you'll see people... You know, preach the gospel, get people saved, just, just, you know, get involved in all the challenges, do all this stuff, and then this off. And then stop coming to church, and then where are you? It's a fact. It's sad. I don't want, I wish it never happened, but it happens. Another reason for the importance of the sermon is that don't ever think, well, that's not going to happen to me. It could. You don't know. I don't know. You know, don't, uh, but don't, why not for yourself to allow it to happen? Look at Galatians 6, verse number 7. The Bible says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. 
So we get this warning saying, hey, you know, be careful with what you're doing. Ultimately, with your time, what are you sowing? Are you doing good or are you doing bad? Because if you're doing bad, you're going to reap of that. But if you're doing good, hey, you're going to reap of that too. And verse number nine says, and let us not be weary in well-doing. Don't be weary. Don't get worn out. That's what we mean, weary, being tired. You're doing good. Keep plugging away. Keep plugging away. Your flesh may be weak. But just give it that little bit more. Keep plugging away. Why? For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Don't just allow yourself to, to oh, it's just too much work. Forget it. Well, now you're going to lose out on that reaping. Stick it out a little bit more. You have the faith to, to see, oh, it's, it's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth the persecution. It's worth enduring. It's worth the, the, the struggle. It's worth giving up some, some physical pleasures and, and, you know, comforts to just keep going a little bit more. Keep pushing away. If we faint not in due season, we shall reap. God is good. God is just. God is faithful. God will reward you. Keep moving forward. Keep strengthening the spirit. The Bible says in verse 10, as we have therefore opportunity. Every opportunity we have, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who have the household of faith. Don't be weary in well-doing, and as much as you have opportunities, hey, do good unto all men. Do good. Do right. Walk in the Spirit, and especially unto them in the household, especially to other church members, especially to other brothers and sisters in Christ. Do good. Amen. Let this, you know, maybe hopefully help you and strengthen you. We're doing challenges. I've said this before, I reiterate it. We do the challenges every month because I want you to help just, just be in the Spirit more right. by doing these different things and making it a part of your life on a regular basis. So that we can all be more strengthened and, and walking in the spirit even more. And keep pushing forward and keep moving forward and as much and, and to recognize opportunities. Because the opportunities are all there. Sometimes we're just blind to them or ignorant about them. Let's focus on these opportunities and not let them pass us by. Let's not get weary. Yeah, there's a lot of challenges. Yeah, I'm going to push you. But don't be weary in well-doing. Because the, the extra push, the extra challenge... It will reap great rewards yeah. one day. Yeah. You won't see it tomorrow. Yeah, right. You won't see it next week. But it is there and it is coming. Let's do good. Let's do good on all men, especially those of the household. Of as far as that word, word prayer. Lord, thank you so much for allowing us to have this, this new spirit, this new man within us that... Uh, that, is, that has been born of your seed of the word of God. God, I pray that you would please help us to, to find the way to be able to walk in our spirit and not in our flesh. Lord, help us to mortify the deeds of our flesh, to put them away, and to, uh, and to not focus on those things, but to rather just focus on doing things that we know are right. Help us to not lose any opportunities to do good unto all men, and that we wouldn't be weary and faint, Lord, but that we can stay strong through our faith, we can stay strong through edification and love by others in church and be encouraged and, uh, and lifted up, dear God, to be able to continue just week after week, day after day, to be able to, to serve you, God. We love you, and, we're in, and we want to do our best for you, Lord. Help us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.